Hello, everybody. I'm journalist Alison Jane Reed from the Luminaries, which showcases the art of journalism and storytelling. And today, my guest is David Shopeland, who is off to Edinburgh to uh, perform his solo play on Awesome Worlds, which is called Raising Cain. Now, um, David, welcome to the Thank Luminaries you. show. What made you want to play the boy wonder? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I suppose I have, I, I guess since my kind of mid-teens, where uh, when I first started really getting into kind of directing and making shows and things like that, is when um, my, my parents and, and other kind of older family members who were a bit perhaps more aware of, of Wells uh, than, than I was at that age started making comparisons to uh, how he kind of, you know, went off to went off to Dublin at the age of sixteen and started acting at the at theatres over there. And he was, you know, he was directing. even younger. He was even yeah. younger. He was fourteen when he turned up, pitched up at the Gate Theatre, yeah, um, on um, lead roles. I mean, it, it's quite remarkable. Uh, absolutely, and he was, you know, someone that then went off off to directing in on. Broadway and the New York stage in his early 20s and, and you know, making possibly the greatest film of all time in his mid-20s. I mean, I, I can't pretend to have got anywhere anywhere near that, but I think the fact that it's quite, I suppose, generally unusual for someone to start getting into the kind of directing side and the theatre-making side in their kind of early to mid-teens, there was a lot of comparison, but, oh, you're like a young Orson Welles and things like that. And so I thought, oh, we'd head up to Edinburgh on Sunday, I think. So it's, uh, yeah, just double and triple checking everything making sure that we're we're there everything's in order everything's kind of done and yeah it's also a big commitment isn't it i mean yeah quite grueling you've got to do the whole month with just a, yeah. a few nights off uh, absolutely yeah so yeah we've got uh i think it's the 14th and the 21st off and then yeah it's it's every day every day other than that for the whole month yeah yeah i was wondering you know how how you as a as an actor and a producer how you cope with the the physical side the physical and mental side of um performing every day i mean obviously if it's a big production you would have an understudy but i imagine you yeah. don't for this no. you have anyone else playing no awesome. no absolutely yeah i th i think it's just um uh, I think routines, I think, are particularly important. That's something that I found in, in, in the past when doing kind of intensive um, intensive shows and just and just making sure that you uh, that you pace yourself. You know, I think the the Edinburgh Fringe is is such a kind of overwhelming place, especially as as a fan of theatre as well as a maker of it. You know, you don't want to pass up the opportunity to you know, have three and a half thousand shows at your at your fingertips, but at the same time, you have to remind yourself that, you know, if you see five or six shows every day, you're going to burn out pretty quickly. Oh, so God, yeah. And you'll be yeah, overwhelmed. You'll it, be exactly. Overwhelmed. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So it's, um, yeah, kind of making sure you have kind of little little rituals, taking time to to decompress and and um just yeah look, looking after yourself as much as possible really look, yeah look after yourself in order yeah. to be able to to give great performances night after night yeah so yeah so we're, um, we're thinking about about um your early exposure to awesome world so, so you grew up in a creative family which has similarities with Orson's uh, formative years. Yeah. His mother yeah. was a very talented and beautiful pianist. His father was an inventor, but also a bit crazy and um, a bit of a good time man by by all accounts, um, who dragged Orson Welles off on his incredible trips. You come from a highly creative background. Tell me about your mother and father. David. Yeah, yeah. So um and the so grandfather. My, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So yeah, my my uh my dad my parents both both retired now, but my dad uh, for most of his career worked in uh the publishing industry for a large part of that for Methuen, uh publishing company who uh are kind of the probably still now the, the, the largest kind of publisher of uh plays, texts and play collections. Uh so he with someone that was frequently at 
you know, lunches with with kind of luminary people, such as Arthur, it was Arthur Miller's 80th birthday, for example, um, on the same table as Tom Stoppard and things like that. And uh, uh, met John Steinbeck, spent three days with Paul McCartney, all these kinds of all these kinds you, of things. You need Robin these Schultz. people, David, as, as I mean, childhood. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I was very, very young. A couple of people I, I sort of crossed, crossed paths with, but um, I I was uh, uh, a, a surprise, shall we say, for my parents. They were both in their early 40s when they, when they had me. So um, I, it was kind of uh, his sort of big career that was actually kind of before before I came along. Um, but uh, yeah, I have sort of a few hazy kind of very early memories. Uh, uh, Louis de Bernier, the writer captain for his mandolin was, was someone who I remember being around quite, quite a lot. He became quite good friends with my parents and things like that. Um, Were you an only child? Yeah, so he's a, uh, no, I, I have a, a sister and a, and a brother, but yeah, big age gap. So my brother's 21 years older than me and my sister's 18 years old. So yeah. How do you think gap. that, that uh has also helped to nurture your career as a as a writer, director, and actor, growing up in that creative household and being a bit of an accident coming along <laughs> uh, as a as a lovely surprise. Yeah, yeah. I, absolutely. I I think um, I think it was uh, certainly. I feel very lucky to have had a very kind of nurturing environment. I never had to kind of feel like I was rebelling against my parents' wishes or my family's wishes, because as you say, they came from a, a equally kind of creative background. Uh, my uh, my brother less so, my sister is a librarian. That was her training trip to one of the last people in the country to do a, a B lib of actor in librarianship before they changed it to a, to a BA. And so very much literary as well. Uh, and actually is currently working on, on writing, uh, writing her first book, which is really exciting. So I think we've always been uh, inspired by our parents to kind of follow what our passions were. Um, my brother works a lot with automobiles and he, as a child, grew up playing with cars. My sister spent most of her childhood reading books and, and I would get into the, the fancy dress box and kind of force my family to put on shows. Was, <laughs> that, was, was that very much childhood. encouraged, David? Was that yeah, encouraged? Was. There wasn't a horror of you wanting to um, go on the stage because, you know, a lot of parents would be dead against it because of the insecurity, because so few uh, people absolutely. can actually make a living from it. it it's either yeah. riches or rags. Uh, absolutely like not. Yeah, I, I think my, uh, you know, my, my parents have, yeah, all, always just been very much of the mindset of kind of, you know, follow follow what what you're passionate about you know they, they could see that from a from an early age um my my mother as well incredibly creative a, a, an artist and, and a writer as well and actually there was a period of time in my education where I was kind of I was between schools and I ended up being homeschooled for a year by by my mother and she would uh kind of choose a, a topic or a theme every day with ancient Greece ancient Egypt and uh every day would be split up into different activities not just kind of academically learning about the history but we would create you know lego structures of, of an egyptian greek temple and then we would uh, draw uh, copies of ancient egyptian art and we would cook together food from that culture and that period of history and things like that so so there was always this kind of holistic uh, approach to my education from from my from my parents as well so um that's yeah, a far think, better way to nurture the imagination of a child. You were very lucky. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I it was, yeah, it was, it was an amazing kind of uh, uh, experience for, for that year. I mean, I, I must have been seven, six, something like that. But uh, it was, uh, yeah, I still have fond, fond memories of that time. Now, do you remember? Do you remember when you first saw Citizen Kane? Because I remember that I was about fourteen or fifteen. And it was one of the things that made me feel absolutely compelled to be a journalist really? and to write about film and actors. I was completely mesmerized by Awesome Worlds and the and the ideas in the film, which you know yeah. explores the idea of, of really of money and power in the newspaper world, which I was really interested in from a very early age. 
that having that kind of power, but the ability to abuse it, uh, and yeah. the fact that the tragedy of of Cain is that he lost the love of, of his mother and his parents. It was taken away from him, and that informed the rest of his life and his decision making. Yeah, uh, uh, absolutely. I think um, I yeah I I remember I remember watching it pretty young and, and, and not quite understanding the kind of the themes of it so much but being wowed by technical aspects even sort of I probably was only about nine or ten when I first kind of saw it and then revisiting it again when I started really getting quite heavily into uh film and cinema as a as a kind of fan and started buying Empire magazine every month and learning more about kind of how films are structured and made and then revisiting it again and, and just being completely in awe of uh the Greg Tolan cinematography and 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 just the, the structure of the story and the prosthetics and ev everything about it considering the time period it was, it was made in and uh and then I think I revisited it again a third time when I was at drama school studying at drama school and so this uh, was when you when you were at Rose Bruford yeah yeah and uh and the the particular degree I did was actually in American theatre arts and I spent the second year of my studies uh out in the states in Texas at a at a uh, state university in East Texas and because uh we were kind of on the kind of American style of of higher education we had a few kind of electives that we could choose alongside our, our kind of curricular studies and I chose to do history of cinema and I had to do an essay for that and I did an essay about um, basically arguing the case that Citizen Kane and The Matrix are the two most important films for the progression of the actual techniques of filmmaking. Um, so I, I uh, went back obviously and, and delved deeply into it that film again for a kind of third time um and now i've i mean i've watched it countless times preparing for for great I can say, how, well. how many how many times do you watch it in preparation for your solo show raising cane because yeah i mean I, it, it, I mean i've watched it twice in the last week yeah uh, preparing to interview you and i i watched magnificent ambersons which i love yeah. And I love The Third Man. That was another film that had a huge influence on me as a teenage girl. They're just, you know, yeah. they, they haven't dated. No. They're, they're, no. they're as powerful now as when they first came out. Absolutely. The cinematography absolutely. is so wonderful. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I think he, you know, he was such an, he was such an innovator and he was such a, uh, maverick and 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 large and, and a rebel and you know and, and one of the things i i talk about which I, I mentioned this in a in a previous interview i was doing the the other day is i think one of the things i really love about the story of of the making of kane and kind of the birth of, of wells as the auteur is so much of it was accidental you know so many of those uh filmmaking techniques he kind of invented because he didn't know any different because he'd never made a film before and I love that kind of ignorance is bliss aspect of the of the making of of Kane and how he was uh just kind of stumbled upon new well he had some lessons to, didn't he I, I came things. across yeah. one interview well, yeah. where, where you know he was able to run into the most uh talented filmmakers and cinematographers yeah. and he would just pick their brains and he yeah. said you know it's not difficult it took a day and a half to learn well <laughs> that's if you're awesome wells because you know yeah. his headmaster said that he was very gifted and yeah. obviously exceptional exceptionally bright and yeah. you know he he was a renaissance figure who uh did everything from sawing uh, Marlena Dietrich in half yeah. and enjoying the pleasure of doing that and then fortunately putting her back together again yeah. but writing directing screenplays being an extraordinary innovator yeah. an actor that we can't forget um, yeah. involved in politics writing a newspaper yeah. col column and apparently constantly practicing magic I, mean, I was going to say yeah magician as well <laughs> yeah yeah, I mean, it, yeah. 
you hear about these figures at that time. I mean, cinema was new. And I, I think it's the same when you look at, at rock and roll in the 60s. The most extraordinary things happen at the beginning of a new genre. That's yeah. often when the most exciting talent emerges and the idea that you can try anything. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I think um, that was that was one of the the kind of key themes of the of of this show that I wanted to really imbue was was that that aspect of kind of fearlessness. And also he talks a lot in the research I did about collaboration. You know, he says he he there's a quote I found where he says, I always need, I always needed collaborators, co-conspirators, if you will, uh, maybe more than money or an audience. You know, and I think that's something that is really interesting when most of us think about Wells as being that kind of atypical auteur. He did everything himself, everything on his own, but actually he really loved working with people, learning from people, uh, creating things together. I mean, the Mercury Theatre project was a was the huge uh, example of, of that. You know, he was someone of the theatre and, and being of the theatre, you, you rely on, you know, the ensemble, you rely on, on the team. And I think that was something I wanted to, yeah. yeah he, he was generous. Again. That's interesting because, you know, mm -hmm. he's been portrayed as someone who didn't get on with Hollywood that he yeah. was difficult, that yeah. um, Simon Callow, mm. who I've interviewed, who's a huge um, yeah. fan of Orson Welles and has written, I think, three or four books on him, yeah. describes him as um, exuding an air of aristocratic entitlement. I love that. <laughs> yeah. But of course, you know, that they were phenomenally wealthy, his family. Yeah. And he was, you know, he would have grown up in that atmosphere of being told he could do and have anything. Yeah, he wanted, but that's interesting that he was generous about collaboration because mm. he wasn't liked by Hollywood. And no. Citizen Kane, of course, angered Hearst, yeah. who tried to have the the film destroyed. Yeah, and didn't succeed, fortunately. But yeah, it 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 didn't win. Uh, you know, it didn't sweep the board at the Oscars because no. of that, and it was described yeah. as box office poison. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and yeah, we touch upon upon that in the in 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 the show as well and you know i think it was yeah nominated for i think it was nominated for nine awards and it was nine, nine one awards, of them i think yeah. wasn't it yeah yeah, yeah. and uh, i mean he and, should have got best actor yeah yeah i mean uh, but but again you know he talks about the the underestimating the reach of of Hearst's power and and how much pressure and 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 uh, weight he put on the industry as a whole because of all of these you know all of the scandals that uh, Hearst Press had uh, kind of subdued at, at the behest of the studios and things, like, and saying we well, you know we it was there was so much political machinations behind it um, that I don't think they they once he got wind of the the film and yeah I don't think he ever stood a chance. But uh, again, just another little tidbit about Orson's um, generosity because I think that is important. That there's a lovely story about him, uh, about uh, Morris Seidemann, who was one of the makeup artists who was involved in the prosthetics. He was a, a um, Russian immigrant, and so he wasn't actually allowed to be credited in the film because he couldn't get the union card. And uh, so it, in placement of that, Orson actually ran a full page ad in Variety, I think for about a month, uh, saying Morris Seidemann is the best makeup artist in Hollywood. <laughs> Wonderful. Because, How uh, generous. In the film, which is just lovely. Yeah. 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 Really and, lovely. Uh, he was always doing these kind of li little things that I think don't, uh, yeah, kind of not many people know about that side of him. So that was, that was something I wanted to put in. Having said that, I was also, you know, I, um, the previous show I did before this one, I, I wasn't in it, but I, I wrote directed it, was, was about Britney Spears actually, and uh, some completely different, but about the kind of conservatorship battle and things like that but, but I, equally I fascinating you know for, yeah. for, for a, a young woman who became such a huge star to yeah. then lose her own freedoms yeah yeah and um most and, of us in in western society would take for granted to be controlled yeah. like that um absolutely it's really tragic and, and frightening yeah yeah for sure and i think the the um kind of impetus behind that show and the impetus behind this show is I, I, I'm never interested in 
things about real people where I can see it's really obviously been written by a fan and it's just very congratulatory and celebratory of that person and it's kind of there's there's objectivity yeah and so I again with with actually that that show about Britney became much more about the rise of the hashtag free Britney movement and what I found really interesting about that was the fact that she hadn't at that point ever acknowledged it or ever asked for help and it was suddenly the fans brought it upon themselves and so that was more of an outside eye of of looking objectively at that kind of fan star dynamic and and this equally I wanted to absolutely look at the the flaws of the man and especially as he you know as he got older and you know reading uh count read about 10 or 12 different books of collated interviews with him and Peter Bogdanovich and and other great directors and 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 it's tough going because you know those those interviews of him in in the last in the last years of his life kind of getting into the early 80s it was it was um it was really a a, a very angry bitter quite sad quite lonely guy and uh and it's quite like Callow touches Simon Callow yeah. talks about that I mean yeah. there's no doubt you know that he did the the infamous War of the Worlds uh, adaptation, yeah. which succeeded in terrifying America, yeah. where um, the American public thought that there was generally a Martian invasion. Yeah. yeah. And Walter Winchell, the fa- the famous uh, columnist and journalist, mm. went on air to say that America hadn't fallen. It, it was an incredible <laughs> feat. It- yeah. And so he had these extraordinary early successes. He was really young. That was before Citizen, well before Citizen came. Yeah. He was really young. Yeah. And and then obviously he was 26 when he wrote, directed, starred, and produced Citizen Kane. Yeah. He did The Magnificent Ambersons, which he failed to promote, which is yeah. a great film. He said it was a better film. I don't think it's a better film, but I think it's an equally great film. Yeah. Uh, it's different, but it also explores tragedy and reversal of fortune, which he seems yeah. to be very interested in. But uh, Simon Callow talks about him peaking early and then the rest of his life being challenging because mm-hmm. he sabotaged himself, because he was difficult to work with uh, yeah. because of the sense of entitlement. But also, you know, he he was he questioned everything. He was very interested yeah. in politics. He was very interested in the idea of state control through the police. So mm-hmm. you know, he was a bit of an anarchist. Yeah. And he yeah. also um, he says, I'm not a conveyor belt film producer. Mm. Well, thank good he isn't. Otherwise, yeah. we wouldn't have these extraordinary legacies. But that made him difficult to get along with, with the uh, Hollywood machine. Absolutely. And I think... Um, it's it's really interesting because you you know in so many ways I I I I totally admire that about about him in terms of he he kind of it speaks to his his artistic integrity as a as a creator and a maker and actually he would you know he would rather um, not have that long career of of fame and, and and power and celebrity and playing because he didn't, yeah. yeah because he wouldn't compromise his artistic vision uh, but then and which, which is a very admirable position and decision to take but then it becomes difficult when he is when he spends the the sort of latter half of his life at any given opportunity constantly admonishing the the industry for not giving him the career he felt like he deserved and 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 you know even, even he made though, you know he made ads didn't he for drinks yeah. companies yeah um, I mean there's the you know the incredible voice I I've yeah. seen those ads it's quite mesmerizing yeah but, you know it is sad in one respect but then who can say that they have films that are as watched and loved yeah. and as powerful now yeah. as they were when he made them? Absolutely, absolutely. And I mean, I think, and, and, and you know, uh, uh, Chimes at Midnight is is one of my favourite uh, Wells is as well. And uh, that, I mean, he's such a Falstaffian character at that point in his life anyway. It was 
perfect kind of casting and and there's there's so many other great works that that aren't as well known uh if i can you know if through this show i can i can introduce some of the other amazing uh uh works of wells i mean uh f for fate the, the art forgery you know doc documentary um is is a huge actually f for fate might be without giving too much away about what happens in the show might be a the biggest influence of all on this show, even more than, than Citizen Kane, funnily enough, because um, structurally there's a there's there's a lot in 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 my show that uh, is uh, is linked to uh, to F of Fate. But yeah. Do you do you like your subject matter all the the time you've uh, been spending? <laughs> How do you feel yeah. about your role model? yeah it's um do you know what that's it's it that's a very uh that's a very pertinent question because that's kind of what the show ends up being about uh again without without wanting to give too much away but there's a layer there's a layer within the show that starts to uncover itself that starts to bleed the realities of uh my own life and and the life of of, of Orson and and Kane and uh, play a, a little bit with with the kind of meta theatricality of that and and it is all linked to, um, uh, yeah, the thoughts I have about someone that I have spent a long time, a long part of my life uh, idolizing. You know, in in my early teen years when I really started to you know, read lots about him and then, you know, finding those, I've read all the Callow books and I just think they're marvellous um, depictions of, of, of him, you know, Simon's obviously a huge fan. Um, and uh, and then, yeah, doing doing so much research into the actual verbatim dialogue, because I wanted to put a lot of his own words into this show. Um, and... Can I ask what, what aspects mm. of him you do put into the show without giving too much away, but enough to tantalise us? I mean, I, yeah. I love it where he says, I, yeah. you know, I'm I'm not about what I've done. I'm always about what I'm about to do. But it, it, there's also that he yeah. talks a lot about fear, fear of what the critics are going to say. I'm worried about what mm. you're going to say. There's this wonderful interview. Have you seen the 1955 press interview, which is on the BBC at the moment, where he's grilled by four or five of Fleet Street's finest? Mm. Have you seen yeah. it? Yes, yeah. It's, um, it's called Press Conference. And yeah. I mean, he's the master dissembler. He's yeah. he's brilliant. But, but yeah. he does give I... something of himself where he gives away his insecurities during the interview he's, yeah. he's very yeah. amusing and witty and yeah. endlessly inscrutable but you still learn something about the man absolutely i mean there's there's a a a little something that's talked about in the in the in the show is is his uh yeah uh he refers to himself as again i think this was taken verbatim from one of the interviews or, or, or transcripts conversations I read with him where he talks about being incredibly thin skinned and he says he believes everything bad uh, that's written about him that, that, that he reads and things like that. And, and that uh, resonated with me, certainly in my early years uh, coming out of drama school as a professional theatre maker and uh, very, very embarrassing story. It was the first, the first bad review uh, I I ever got it as well. It was the first professional show I wrote and directed, and uh, and uh, it, it it wasn't so much that it was a negative review. It was that I felt like it was it was unfairly attacking two of the actresses in the cast to the point of the review actually directly addressed in second person those actors, and I thought that was kind of crossing a line. Crossing a a line. That's, that's cool. Um, I I do yeah. think there's a responsibility that the journalist has a responsibility to the people they're writing about. Um, yeah. and I think that's often flouted. And, you know, you're dealing with a human being that you're writing about. And yeah. journalists wield yeah. a lot of power. Yeah. And you um, know, I felt yeah. that and with so, the thrilling yeah, yeah. of Orson Wells in 1955. I mean, I, th I think it's terrifying to 
to be an actor or to be someone who is thrust into the limelight at any point yeah. without without training, without support. Yeah. It's utterly yeah. terrifying because some of yeah. those comments are, are, are going to live forever. Yeah, ab absolutely, absolutely. Um, and so I felt kind of, uh, however old I would have been, 22, something like that, and, and uh, was, was uh, very enraged and I and I made the very unwise decision it was it wasn't a newspaper it was a sort of online blog type thing and I and I wrote a comment as pretending to be an audience member disagreeing with the bad review and oh, then for, and then forgot what I was doing and, and signed off with my own name <laughs> and then our, our marketing person had to pull up from me. Uh, our director was just fearless and I learned an angry Please take this comment off. We completely respect your uh, your right to disagree with you for all this stuff, and and managed to kind of smooth it over. And uh, and I felt yes, very very embarrassed about that afterwards. But uh, and about two or three years didn't read any reviews at all of my work. And then as I got a bit more older and mature, went do you know what? Every, <laughs> everyone is absolutely entitled to to uh, dislike anything I make and, and question things. And 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 I certainly. Uh, don't think everything I make is 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 great either. And we all we're all still learning, and we're all still uh, striving to be better.